All right, let's get started, shall we? Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from Investor Stream, and I'll be your host this morning. Today, we have Red Bank Copper Executive Chairman Michael Hannington, who will be presenting to today following the company's relisting on the ASX this week. Michael will be giving a short presentation on the upcoming plans for Red Bank, as well as an update on operational progress. And uh, we'll also be on hand to address any questions following the presentation. Uh, with regards to questions, you can send them through to me, alex at investorstream.com.au, or you can also send your questions in via the chat platform in the GoToWebinar control panel, or in the question pane in that same panel. Um, you can also download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. And a copy of the webinar will be available on Red Bank's website later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Mike, who's gonna kick things off for us. Mike, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alex. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this presentation was released to the ASX on Tuesday morning as Red Bank came out of uh, over one year in suspension. So we started trading again on Tuesday morning. Uh, I intend going through a simple page by page uh, description on the presentation. And then if there's any further details that people want on Red Bank and the journey so far, uh, then I'll, I'm happy to answer the questions at the end. So the opening slide you see there is the Sandy Flat Pit. Interestingly, you see the road that is in the foreground there. That's the road that connects the Northern Territory with far North Queensland. It's a good road. All the grey nomads travel along that road when they're tourists uh, going across Northern Australia. So there's pretty easy access. It is remote, but the access is fairly easy there. Um, just going to the first slide. So I'm going to go through this one by one. First mover position, what you'll see on a following slide is the tenement position that we've got. We are one of the largest tenement holders in the Northern Territory. We have got granted tenements and applications that cover approximately 11 and a half thousand square kilometres. So if you're thinking about a distance, that's a distance of about 250 to 300 kilometres in strike length of a district in the MacArthur Basin. It's a very large area. If you're in Perth, it's somewhere between Perth and Meriden. If you're in Sydney, it's from Sydney out into across the, the Blue Mountains. So very large tenement holding. One of the reasons that we've got that uh, tenement holding is that for the last three and a half years, Geoscience Australia was handed $100 million by the federal government, taxpayers' money, to try and identify the areas in Australia that have the potential to host the next series of very large base metal deposits. One of the problems that Australia has had over the last few decades is that no really large deposits have been discovered in Australia, but there's been a number of world-class base metals deposits discovered in other countries around the world. And what Geoscience Australia is doing is trying to rectify that. On the Red Bank project, we currently have a Jork resource. Uh, it's a 2004 Jork resource of a little over 6 million tonnes at 1.5%. So all up, that's about 96,000 tonnes of contained copper in a series of seven bre vertical breccia pipes. And there's an example of that in a further slide. This project has been uh, operated since the early 1900s. So there was a prospector that was a sole miner that mined this area from 1916 to 1961. There's been various other groups like Newmont and CRA that have done exploration work there. And uh, CRA were the discoverers of the Century Deposit, which is just over the border in Queensland. Uh, current work programs, we've currently got uh, two field crews out there. I've got one crew that is resampling about 25,000 metres of drill core that's currently stored in two core sheds out at the Red Bank Exploration Camp. And I've got another field crew doing geological field ping and soil sampling out there. We are going to soil sample an area of about 400 square kilometres, so very big soil sampling program happening right now. 
previous explorers out there have identified over 50 breccia pipes in a very restricted area. Now these are the breccia pipes that daylight. We've done further work, desktop work, and we believe that there is a large number of breccia pipes that are much larger in diameter that don't actually daylight onto the surface. And we're very interested in doing some soil sampling over those to see if those larger breccia pipes uh, actually have any indication of copper in the soils above them. We've also had another relook at the Sandy Flat mine site and looking at extracting copper from the surface copper that's remaining in the tailings dam and also in the uh, surface heap leaches. So management team, over the last year, we've managed to attract a number of geologists that are acting as consultants for us uh, that have got plus 30 years experience. Um, so two of the geologists that are out there right now are both plus 30 year experience geologists. You can see the next slide here. This shows the tenement area. So on the Queensland Northern Territory border with the darker line, you can see the tenements that are granted. That's a little over 3,000 square kilometres. Back in July, we pegged the area between the Red Bank tenements and out to the MacArthur River mine. So we are right at their front gates now. That area is over 11,000 square kilometres. The field mapping we're undertaking right now obviously is not going over that huge area. Um, that area is, if you measure from the MacArthur River mine to where the Wallagrang station is, is somewhere a little over 250 kilometer line distance there. So we've got a district scale exploration play with an existing resource close to the Sandy Flat mine. That Sandy Flat mine has just accessed one of the breccia pipes. There's six other breccia pipes that have copper mineralization in them. How did we go about identifying this area? Um, as I described on a previous slide, Geoscience Australia has spent $100 million of taxpayers' money identifying the next region in Australia that they think is highly prospective. And it's uh, no surprises, an area between the MacArthur River mine and going down towards Mount Isa, but in particular, the area that we have pegged. Geoscience Australia has just received another $125 million of taxpayers' money to continue doing collecting pre-competitive data and providing further geoscientific information to the uh, explorers. And uh, we are going to uh, take full advantage of that information that's going to be generated over the coming years. You can see to the left of the slide, there's a diagram explaining conceptually where we are um, and uh, over the last two years there's been a lot of work done trying to understand why these big deposits are where they are and part of that story is related to what's happening at depth and how heat is generated in the asthenosphere to cook up fluids that are in sedimentary basins moving metals around. So we believe that the area that we already have and that we have pegged has got a perfect ingredients to form large copper deposits. Now, why do we, why do we think that? Well, the breccia pipes that have already been drilled by previous explorers, uh, we believe that that is indicating that there's a lot of copper around in the system. And when we go out uh, mapping the ground, there is copper, um, in the form of copper oxides, malachite and azurite everywhere on the rocks. What we're trying to do is not just locate that, but locate, locate where the copper is uh, concentrated into an ore body. So we believe that by collating all the previous data that explorers have got and looking at some of the new work that Geoscience Australia is producing, that we're going to generate an identikit of how we go and vector in and target in on mineralization. The soil sampling survey is obviously a new way of trying to locate that. That was the method used to locate the century deposit, just simple soil sampling, looking at a soil anomaly and then walking the ground. So Red Bank's not really doing anything complicated. 
with the activity we're undertaking, but we're ensuring that we collect and collate all the information that we can possibly get. This zooms in a little further to identify a large number of breccia pipes that are surrounding the existing resources. So you can see on the diagram to the right, the uh, circles that are in red are the existing, uh, form the existing resource. The other circles are not part of the resource, but they are breccia pipes, and a, num a large number of those haven't even been drilled. They've been mapped because they daylight at surface. So this is highlighting all the breccia pipes that you can actually identify at the surface. Um, the question is, are there much bigger breccia pipes that haven't quite daylighted? And that's what the soil sampling survey will help us understand. So as I said before, we've got activity happening out on the ground right now. It's beautiful conditions out there, middle of the dry season, mid 30 degrees C, nice and dry. Everyone's able to get around quite easily. There's quite a lot of station tracks out there. So it's not difficult getting around the countryside. This is a diagram that I've pulled from a previous report. Um, this shows the basic stratigraphy. What we're looking at is a series of rocks that's somewhere between 1.7 and 1.8 billion years old, hosting copper. So if you think about the uh, MacArthur River mine, which is a zinc dominant deposit, the rocks there are about 80 million years younger than the rocks we're looking at here. So we're looking at rocks about 80 million years older. They've been identified and looked at by the Northern Territory Geological Survey when they've been mapping, but have been very underdone as far as exploration by companies looking for copper deposits. Now, part of the story behind that is the prospector that was mining those breccia pipes and uh, hand collecting and sorting the copper that's at the surface. He was there from 1916 to 1961, and he died actually out at the site when he was 91 years old. He was hand sorting and collecting copper that was grading over 30% copper from the surface. He was sticking that copper in pack horses. Pack horses were going about 60 kilometers to the um, coastline of the Gulf of Carpentaria. And then a coastal trader was taking them around the top to Port Kembla. So he made money all the way through that. Following his death in 1961, there was a number of companies that had a look at the project area until 1970 when Newmont took over. Newmont did a lot of drilling and discovered a lot of the breccia pipes that you see there in that diagram. Post 1970, uh, Nixon um, decided to uh, break the gold standard and the Newmont geologists were told by head office in Denver to move out of base metal exploration overseas and came back to the US. And um, they uh, obviously started exploring for gold there, which is a good decision. So post-1970, Newmont left, gets into the early 80s, and CRA had a field office at Burktown and did a lot of mapping through the area, but really no more drilling through here. So go to the next slide, and uh, this shows you a, two views of the Sandy Flat deposit. You can see there the pit, the pit is actually filled in with water. So let me just go through the figure seven, the top diagram there. What we did when we uh, man new management took over in August last year, in October, we went out to site and we sampled the surface uh, dumps, the ROM dump, the tailings dam, and you can see there the little table below gives the assay results. Those assay results are head assays as part of metallurgical test work that we're doing um, so that we can understand how to easily extract the copper. The only um, mineral there is uh, charcoal pyrite. There's uh, a bit of um, copper oxide that's there as well. So the mineralization is very simple. Unfortunately, there's no gold in the system. But the sampling that we did, we tried to uh, ensure that we just sampled rock that looked boring and unappealing, and it came back with fairly high grades. 
So the one to look at in particular is the main tails that assay 4.89%. The reason that we believe that the tailings dam assayed so high grade is that the um, processing plant was a sulphide, uh, was a flotation circuit that's optimised for uh, processing copper sulphide and a lot of the early um, mineralisation that came out was copper oxides. So it didn't completely extract all the copper out, so we believe that there's quite a large amount of copper still in the tailings dam. You can see in that oblique diagram uh, on the bottom of the slide that it highlights the old leach pads and we believe that there's a large amount of copper still in there as well. So we're currently finalising a process flow sheet and understanding how to extract the copper out. That is going to be part of a rehabilitation exercise. The Northern Territory Government has the liability to rehabilitate. So we are seeking to collaborate with the Northern Territory Government to help them to clean up the surface copper that's uh, at the surface there. Moving on to South Australia, uh, this tenement was acquired uh, a little over two years ago. It's actually sandwiched in between major tenement holdings that Oz Minerals and FMG hold. Um, it was previously called Mount Paisley and IMX Resources had it. Uh, you can see figure nine shows the gravity anomalies. There's been one deep drill hole that was put in by IMX in 2008 and we're currently in the process of we've rediscovered uh, pulps at an assay lab from that initial assay that was only assayed for a small number of elements and we're reassaying that right now so we should have the results out of that in the next month or so that's got a number of gravity anomalies there we're not rushing to go out there and drill a hole a deep hole like that's going to cost us uh, close to a million dollars so we're in the process of assessing what the uh, ongoing potential is there, given that there's been very little drilling out there. So activity for the next 12 months. As I described earlier, we've got field mapping underway right now. I mean, there's no better and cheaper way uh, than to go out and map the rocks at the surface. Um, our field geologist that you can see out there in the diagram at the bottom right is Alan Ronk. Alan used to work for Mark Creasy for 20 years. So what he's looking at is one of the original 1970 maps that we retrieved from the geologist's office out at the Red Bank field camp when we were there earlier on this year. Um, soil sampling program, 400 square kilometers of soils. So we're collecting a soil sample every 500 meters. For the geologists that are listening in, we're using a 4-acid digest, MEMS61, so assaying for 61 elements in the periodic table, we believe that that'll give us a really good opportunity to understand that if we're not right over the top of a copper system, uh, whether one is further at depth. We're also resampling 25,000 metres of drill claw. You can see the diagram there, that's one of the core sheds. Uh, some of the core is in not very good shape and some of the core is actually in extraordinarily good shape. The core that is not in good shape is the core that's still got sulphides in it and there's whole sticks of core there that are coloured green. So what that tells the geologist is that a lot of this core that has uh, had copper that has started oxidising hasn't actually been sampled and assayed. So it's only after many years of being exposed to the outside that you can actually see that. So we believe that there's a lot more copper in the, um, in the system. Uh, um, we're also going to update the Jork resource estimate. So currently that resource estimate is uh, 2004. Um, from the reassaying, we're going to take more um, density measurements on the core. We expect to have a Jork 2012 resource uh, reported sometime towards the end of this year. We're also continuing the technical studies uh, on the Sandy Flat mine site. We've got a proposal to put a little sonic rig on top of the tailings dam and drill a whole series of short vertical holes to extract uh, 
little sausages of semi-consolidated uh, tailings material and then assaying that to understand exactly what uh, how much copper is in there. So we also expect to come out and report a job resource on that tailings dam later on at the end of this year. And again, as I described earlier in a previous slide at Miller's Creek, we should have the assay results from that drill hole out in the next month. Corporate structure, uh, shares on issue, we've now got a little over 400 million. We recently completed a uh, capital raising of $4 million. 2 million via rights issue and 2 million via a placement. We've got about $3.8 million in the bank. Our largest shareholder is the Wiley Group and the top 20 is reasonably highly concentrated with a little over 55% in the top 20. Management holds just under 11%. So I'm the chairman, I've got a background as a geophysicist. I got a law degree about 20, uh, 20 years ago for my sins worked for a number of the big companies and a number of the smaller companies. Daryl uh, was one of the founding shareholders and helped get Northern Star away as well as Bellevue. Uh, Keith Middleton has got a lot of experience working at Coles Meyer and has done a fair amount of consulting work in the industry over the years. So we've got a pretty high functioning board. We're working very well together. Um, and it's taken us about a year to go from where we started in August last year to getting relisted and uh, reinstated on the stock market. And as you've all seen from Tuesday, the market seems to think we've got a pretty good project on our hands, given that we've acquired all that ground and we're going to have a really good crack at assessing how much copper is on the existing tenements. And when we get the other tenements granted, we're going to kick off with exploration doing what everyone does, which is soil sampling and mapping. So the last slide here, this is that road that I described on the first slide, which is what all the grey nomads drive along. You can see this part of the road is sealed. If you look out to the, the hill in the distance there, you could probably make out the breccia pipe that's straight on the end there. So what, that's what they look like. And you can probably see the little hill that's there. These breccia pipes punch up through the stratigraphy when they're exposed like this on the side of the hill. They're very easy to, to see. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Mike. We have had a couple of questions come through. Uh, the first one, early in the presentation, you referenced that Geoscience Australia has spent $100 million on defining what they say is a world-class base metals trend that runs through Red Bank's tenements. How does that influence your exploration strategy? Well, it gets our attention immediately because we don't want to be in areas where we don't think there's any good potential and they've forked out a lot of money to identify an area that has been known about for a long time. I mean, MacArthur Basin is one of these basins that a world-class deposit is hosted in the MacArthur Basin. But the last time that I was involved in looking at this area was when I was a much younger geologist back in the early 90s when I was with Geopico. And back in 92, 93, there were these Amira projects taking place where consortiums of companies got together and uh, tipped some money in for researchers to undertake basic research on finding big ore bodies. And so there's some very good work in the past that Geoscience Australia has taken advantage of. They've also collaborated with a large number of groups out there and done a lot of fundamental work on looking at the bottom up, as I described in that slide earlier on. That uh, diagram came from a, a paper that is soon to be published. It's available on the internet from a guy called Hogarth that's at Harvard University. Um, so it's bringing together a lot of fundamental research, a lot of um, soil sampling that's been done by the Northern Territory Geo Survey. And to be honest with you, uh, Red Bank was just lucky. I was listening to a webinar on the 14th of July that Geoscience Australia had put out, and obviously no one can, um, there was no auditorium in Canberra with 300 geoscientists listening into the results. It was a webinar. And as soon as I started seeing the results presented at the webinar, 
I phoned up our friendly tenement managers in Darwin and organised to peg the ground. And within 24 hours, we'd applied for it and pegged it. So there's a lot of, I suppose, twofold there. One, one it's being being in the area and having an awareness of what the potential is, and the second thing, it's being opportunistic. Thanks, Mike. Can you talk us through your strategy for the Millers Creek project in South Australia? Um, have you had any interest from neighbouring companies? Yes, we have. Um, everyone's aware of that project area, but because the that project area was held for so long by IMX Resources, IMX was previously known as Goldstream. Now, IMX had a joint venture over what's called the Mount Woods Inlier with Oxiana and after that, um, Oz Minerals. And their attention was on the Mount Woods Inlier and their Ken Hill uh, magnetite copper deposit. And there really hasn't been much work undertaken at the um, Millers Creek project, even though we've got two large companies that have large ground positions there. So the, the the answer to trying to reveal what's there is, I believe, a little bit more work. There's some more gravity that needs to be done. Um, we're not racing out there to drill another hole because we believe that best bang for our buck right now is at the Red Bank project in the Northern Territory. But there's definitely interest from other groups in understanding what may potentially be at the Millers Creek project. Broadly speaking, what's your view on the level of resources activity in Northern Australia at the moment? It, it seems to be generating a lot of interest. Yeah, well, if you go across the border into Queensland, you've got companies like South 32, Tech, Oz Minerals, They've either got ground in their own right or they've joint ventured with other companies that have ground. If you're in the Northern Territory and go south of us, you've got Newcrest and Rio Tinto that have pegged ground there. So there's a huge amount of exploration interest there. So we're definitely not the only ones that are grabbing a hold of this information that Geoscience Australia has been publishing and releasing out there. Um, so, Within the geological community, there's a boom going on for pegging all this ground. And as I said before, we, we just got lucky. I know that there was a number of other companies that wanted to peg that ground, and unfortunately, they were just too late. Here's a simple one for you, Mike, and this is one that's come through a number of times. Um, do you have a day in mind for when the next round of drilling is going to commence? Yeah, so we won't be doing any drilling this season. Uh, we want to drill on top of the tailings dam, but that's really understanding how much copper is in the in the tails dam. As far as exploration drilling uh, goes, that'll start next season. So the soil sampling program, the collation of 60 years of previous data, the field mapping, that's all bringing information together so we can get a focused drilling program underway next year. Thanks, Mike, and we've just had one one final one. Um, by the way, everyone, you know, this is probably your last chance to get some questions in if you have any. Um, you mentioned that you're currently collating over 60 years of exploration data. What is this data telling you and how confident are you that you'll be able to increase the current resource? That's actually a very good question. So what it's telling us is that this data has never been collated for this project in the past. In March, we recovered 14 pallets that's 14 pallets with 40 or 50 archive boxes on each one of reports. And that's reports that go back to the 40s for geologists that were looking over the area, all the Newmont work. The Newmont did a full feasibility study on this project. None of that information has been put into a modern GIS with all the soil sampling that's been undertaken. There's over 16,000 soil samples that have been collected on the area and none of it's all being put together. And so we're in the process, just in the background, while our people are out in the field, doing a lot of work in the office collating all this information. So we expect a lot of targets to be generated out of the collation of all that data. Thanks, Mike. Now, that's all the questions that we've had, so that might be a good 
good spot to wrap it up for this afternoon. Um, Mike, really appreciate you jumping on and uh, and presenting. Do you have any last uh, thoughts or comments before we leave? Yeah, I'm really excited about this project and I'm hoping that I can do a few more of these over the coming months because we're generating lots of new information and it's new information that we're going to be putting together with all the previous information. So I think this area is going to start potting up for copper potential, not just over the next few years, but over the next few months as we uh, collect our data with our field crews out there. So I look forward to doing this all over again pretty soon. Beautiful. Well, look, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank Mike for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions. Uh, now, like I mentioned before, recording the webinar will be on the Red Bank website later today. Uh, the investor presentation is also on the ASX platform, so you can uh, download it from there if you, if you so choose. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks, Alex, and thanks everyone for listening in. Thank you.